my name is Tawny Smith and I am one of the members here at Desert Grace. We have a great message for you today. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to give us a thumbs up and leave a comment so we know that you've been blessed. May God continue to bless your family. We've been talking about Jesus. We're, we're leading up to Easter and, and uh, it's kind of an, an incredible time. But you might have noticed that the, the, the gist of the title, the, the idea of intentions, intent is most commonly defined for us as an aim or a purpose. <clears throat> Something that you are trying to do, why you're, why you're trying to do it. So, for example, you may have intentions to do something nice for somebody, or, or you may have intentions to make some chili for the chili cook-off that you either followed through on or you didn't follow through on. Whichever way you might have gone, you might be intending to eat chili, you might not be. Now, intent is quite different from a goal. When we set a goal, we say we want to go there, and we, this is the path we're going to take. Uh, it's more of a, a, a totally different idea. So we wouldn't say that, that Jesus had goals or, or whatever. Sometimes he might have had a goal, but his intentions and what we think about it. If you really want to get down to it, when we use the word intent... What we are really talking about is a deeply held belief. It is different from so many other things that we would be looking at. But it's a conviction as to why, what the motivating factor is for what we're trying to accomplish. So I want to make sure we have this really clear before we go too much further. Now, normally when we talk about someone's intentions, it's when things don't go right. Right? Did you ever hear that phrase, the road to hell is paved with? <laughs> so normally what we talk about is when we intend to do something good, and maybe it doesn't quite come out the way that we had wanted it to do, or we see somebody else who... We know that their heart is there. They were trying to do something good, but, but ultimately something didn't quite go right. There's an interesting fact here, and that is quite simply this. You know all of your intentions. You know what you intended to do, why you intended to do it, what your aim was, what your, your purpose was. All of that you know. But if I want to figure it out, I might be able to figure out based on the way you act, but I would still just be guessing. But in the end, I can't really read in to what you want. We also use the word intent to describe a determination in which, with which one, one will do something. So we would say something like that. They were paying attention to the preacher intently, listening to every word he had to say. Or that preacher was intent on preaching until noon. Don't forget, I know the only thing standing between you and a good bowl of chili is me. <laughs> you see, we have these things that we do. We normally, whatever we're going to de be determined to do or whatever we're resolved to do is based again on those deep convictions. When we intend to do something, when we're resolved to make it happen, it's because we have something we believe in so deeply that sometimes we can't even explain it. And we need to be careful because we know what our intentions are but we're really good at judging what others are. And sometimes we simply don't know. My question for us this morning is what do we learn from misunderstandings of Jesus' intentions? Well, last week I talked a little bit about misunderstanding Jesus' identity. And I, I talked about how his brothers wanted him to go to the festival because after all, he could do tricks that would make him popular. And then Jesus said, you don't really understand who I am, and I'm going to always follow the Lord's timing. And now we see a kind of different part of a story, a little different sort of thing, 
where Jesus ends up in some controversies over his actions or over something that he says or both. If you've ever really paid attention to the stories of Jesus, you'll notice that there's something that he tends to do constantly to really poke the Pharisees. He seems to do it more than anything else that he does. Like even getting up and saying, gee, I'm the son of God, doesn't seem to make them anywhere near as angry as this one thing. And that is when Jesus tries to do something like heal on the Sabbath. You see, all of these times when you begin to believe that Jesus' intent is, what is it to be? Jesus knows. And I think if we really want to talk about the word intentions, you could use both ways right here. You could use both kinds of of, uh, sort of discussions if you really wanted to, where it's not really that it has to be one or the other, Jesus had intentions around the Sabbath to sort of redefine how people were thinking about it. But he was also very determined to make sure that we understood who God is. So, let's talk a little bit about Sabbath, since it seems to be such a big deal. Sabbath rest was a very core part of the Jewish identity. It was a defining characteristic of who they were as a people. I don't know what we would say today if we would say anything about what defines us as a people. Uh, And I, I, I can tell you in the church world, we are supposed to be defined by love. I can tell you that. I don't know that we always are, and I'll come back to that. But but what is the defining characteristic? Well, for the Jews, it was this idea that six days you work, and on the seventh, you rest. And even the pagan cultures around them did not do this. They were not part of that. And so that's something that is really important. We want to remember that the Sabbath was instituted by God. It's frequently brought forward from creation onward, by God, throughout all of the stories. So you, you find the Sabbath in the very first pages of your Bible, and you will find it every so often from then on out. It's important to God that we honor it. And what were the Jews looking at? They were looking at a, a kind of a different sort of thing. And at its core, it's simply rest from labor. It signals sort of an orderedness to life. Now, if you really want to think about what God did, God created out of chaos the world. He put an order to our life, and part of what he did in doing that is six days you work, on the seventh you rest. It's important that we get this. So the Pharisees are the protectors of the cultural identity of the Jews, right? They are the lawyers, the law experts. And their whole entire goal is to make sure that the Jewish people don't look like the pagans. Do you understand what I'm trying to say there? It would be as though I, as your pastor, came to you and said, you know, there's a little problem that I'm having. I'm noticing some of the things you're doing and and some of the things that are taking place in your life. You look no different than the average pagan who doesn't believe in God. And in case you didn't know, we are called to live separately, to live differently, to live in a way that's supposed to be a little more than simply that. So Jesus begins to challenge the Pharisees. He's kind of saying to them, you are too strict in your interpretations. It's not that the law is bad. When we get to reading here in a moment, you've heard the story all before, he's never going to say the law is bad. In fact, Jesus in other places says things like, I have come so that the law would be fulfilled, not so that it would be abolished. So, now we find ourselves in the midst of the controversy. And we can go to Luke chapter 6, the first 11 verses, which are in front of you or printed in your bulletin, or if you still bring a Bible. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields And his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, have you never read that what David did when he and his companions were hungry? 
He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking, and he said to the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and he stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good? or to do evil, to save life, or to destroy it. He looked around them all, and then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. And the Pharisees said, we learned our lesson, and we know now that the Sabbath is not as important as we want. No. (laughs) The Pharisees and the teacher of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. Ah, did you notice that it is such a problem with Jesus in the Sabbath that the the writer doesn't even bother to tell us which of these Sabbaths are even being discussed? They're generic Sabbath days. The detail's not even important. It's not even part of what they're trying to do. (laughs) Oh, I love technology. Jesus' private ministry is over. It's as though like we're kind of seeing through his, his, his glasses, his lens, every move he makes. And so now we get to Luke, and Luke just describes these things. He says on a Sabbath day, they were walking through some fields. They walked through, and they, they pulled some things. Any particular Sabbath day? No. Then on another one, he's standing in the synagogue. There was a man there with, with a shriveled hand. You caught that, right? The Pharisees are sitting there. They are just like so excited. Jesus is going to do something. Maybe he's even going to heal somebody. Wouldn't that be awesome? And the rest of us would be going like, yeah, that would be great. Like this man's hand was shriveled. How awesome would it be that he'd have a normal everyday hand that, that would be useful for him? And they're like, look, if he heals somebody, we can start plotting right? The taking of grain in the field isn't the unlawful act. I don't know if you kind of read through that and it said, why are your people doing what's unlawful on the Sabbath? It's not that they were taking the grain. In fact, Deuteronomy says that you can walk through somebody else's grain field. You're allowed to go ahead and take a little bit of grain off, but you have to do it with your hand. You cannot use a machine or a sickle or something like that because then you're kind of going into theft, The idea is essentially that this is about an immediate need that you have. You're hungry, and when you're hungry, you need food. When you need food, you need it now, or you become hangry. And could you imagine, when there's not convenience stores, where do you go? You can walk through the field, right? That's what you do. Now, harvesting of any type was not permissible on the Sabbath. That was the unlawful act. So you could go and you could pick grain out of your neighbor's field if you need to, but the unlawful act is that you are not resting. Even if you're walking from point A to point B and you're trying to to do everything else right, the problem is you have harvested on the day that you're not allowed to harvest. Now, Jesus kind of has himself in a bit of a pickle here. Because I got to tell you, again, he, he doesn't even address the law part of it and say, well, you know, it's, uh, it's not really the law. And he acknowledges it to a very particular point. But it's important that we recognize that what he's trying to do here, what, he, what his intentions are, is to redefine what we see and to get people to think more like God and less like us. So it's not so much about the law. The Pharisees being the protector of the faith, they're watching Jesus' actions. And by the way, if you didn't figure this out yet, he knows. 
It's as though while he's walking around and they go in there and they're beginning to pick fruit that the guy's like on his elbow, right? Like there's a whole bunch of Pharisees walking with him. And one of them finally says, all right, I'll tell him. Hey, why are you doing that? That's unlawful. Right there, right, right in the moment. It's kind of crazy. I've come to the conclusion that the Pharisee really isn't asking about the law because the Pharisee knows the law, knows Jesus knows the law. Jesus seems to understand the law. So the Pharisee is really asking, why are you willing to do this on the Sabbath? You're willing to disobey the law. And by the way, if you are God who created the law, why would you be willing to, to go against your own law? I mean, it's a legitimate question for a Pharisee. And by the way, if you didn't ever think about it, you should, because it's a legitimate question to be asking of Jesus. Why are you so willing to disobey the law? You see, if Jesus is willing to disobey what makes a Jewish person a Jewish person by doing stuff on the Sabbath, which you are not supposed to do, what is going to happen about those distinctive people who are the people of God? You see, if you want to really talk about the, the Pharisees' intent, they've got the right thing of what they're doing. We need to protect and make sure people understand we don't do this on the Sabbath. And Jesus is going, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. Jesus doesn't even really answer their question. What he does is he says, do you remember King David? And of course they remember King David, right? If you hadn't been around for the last year, I took quite a number of months talking about King David. I told you guys in the past Exodus is a really important book. King David is a very, very important character to understand in the Bible. If you missed all of that, you know, take some time, you know, three, four weeks, go back, watch all the YouTube videos, catch yourself up, because it's important. And you might even remember this story if you were paying close attention. But King David gets brought into the conversation, and basically, it's to show the importance of, of absolute basic human survival. Jesus here is going, hey, do you remember when King David was being pursued by Saul and needed food? What did he do? You might remember David had eaten consecrated bread. Hey, he'd given it to his companions. You go back to 1 Samuel 21, verses 1 through 9. It really, if you want to talk about issue for issue, David's issue was the sort of ritual impurity. There were, there were reasons why you can't eat the consecrated bread. There's no reason why you couldn't walk through the field other than it was the Sabbath. So here Jesus is making a basic argument that, you know what? It's about survival. Humans need to eat. And if you have food and there's food available... It's sometimes more important that someone eat than that we actually pay attention to the letter of the law. Amen. Yep. Now that's what David apparently was thinking. Okay, maybe we're not clean. Maybe we're not doing what we're supposed to do. The ritual cleanness is not a, a, a big thing. But this brings in to absolute focus the tension, the conflict that Jesus is bringing forward, his, his intent, so to speak. What he's trying to say is that you have to make a choice between strict observance of the law or using the law as a guide to what God wants you to do. I want you to pay close attention here because we would do the same thing in our day and age. We would look at a law, and, and in fact, if you aren't strictly observing the speed limit, are you not interpreting what you understand the law to be? I didn't mention any names. Now, I want you to understand 
Jesus isn't making an argument that you should break the law on a, on a regular basis. It's not that he's saying that you ought to be going out, breaking the law, doing all of these crazy things. What he's saying is that you have the right to interpret and to judge in the specific situation how the law applies. Do you follow that? That what Jesus is saying is that even when it comes to God's law, which I would say God gets to be the one that decides, that you basically, Jesus at least, is taking the ability to say, I have the ability to judge what is going on. It's not about breaking the law. What it is, it's about what purpose does the law serve? Now, in the case of the Sabbath, what purpose did the law serve? I've told you a whole bunch of times already, it distinguished between Jewish and pagan culture. It brought order to the world. So it's an important law, it's an important thing to do, but what Jesus is saying is you might want to, instead of that, kind of consider this statement. I'd rather do the right thing and take my chances with God. That if it comes down to it, and in order to be a good Jew, I can't do anything on the Sabbath, but I see a neighbor who desperately needs to eat or to whatever, I'm going to help. And if God is upset with me about that, I'll take my chances. And the reality is, is that God's not going to be upset. He didn't intend for the law to be so strict. He intended for it to be a guide. That's what Jesus is basically saying. David had gone to Ahimelech. He wanted to get some help because he needed food for himself. He was the anointed king at this point. Ahimelech knows he's the appointed king. And Saul is chasing him. Saul is trying to, to absolutely kill him and take him out. So Ahimelech, who is a priest, gives David the consecrated bread and says, basically, you can eat it. And it's not because they were ritually clean or because there was some rule or, or kind of asterisk in the law, but because the priest looked and said, it's better for you to survive than for us to worry about this having been consecrated bread. I want to make sure we understand that. The law is a guide or should be acting as a guide that allows for compassion rather than simply mercilessness. Amen. It's important here. It's what Jesus is doing. So first you have the whole situation out in the field. The next thing, they're lying in wait for him in there in the synagogue. And, and Jesus knows all this. And so he poses a legal question to them about doing good or doing evil, whether you should kill or whether you should save. Now you caught the question, right? It's one of those questions that's unanswerable. If you answer it in the way that you're being strict legalistic, well then, you got a problem. Really, it ends up kind of embarrassing the Pharisees, kind of putting them in a hard spot. And again, Jesus' main point is about compassion. Now part of me is like, look Jesus, the guy with the shriveled hand will still be there tomorrow. You could just as easily wait 24 hours and heal him the next day, right? Like, come on, we can compromise here. But Jesus is saying to him, to the Pharisees, and really to us, why would you wait to show compassion? Why would you wait until some future time to heal somebody simply because the law, which is intended as a guide, is there. The Pharisees end up looking ridiculous. I don't think any of you are like, go Pharisees! In fact, if I were to tell you that I've seen many times in the church world, and, and perhaps even amongst us, where we have acted more like these Pharisees than Jesus, most of us would be embarrassed. Now Jesus 
could have done, you know, I don't know, any number of things. He, he could have said, look, um, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into the pit on the Sabbath, would you not reach in and pluck it out and save it? To which the Pharisees would go, well, of course, the law would allow for that, but this isn't a sheep. Well, what's more worthy, a sheep or a human? You see what Jesus is doing there? He's really getting them, I tell you what. Ultimately, he sends them into a fury. He heals somebody on the Sabbath, not only on the Sabbath, in the synagogue. You really want to make the, the mad, that's all you got to do. It said that they were furious. That's being in a fury. Did you think about that? They were probably stomping out the door. They went and they had an immediate board meeting over whether or not they would allow him back in and what color the carpet ought to be. <laughs> right? I want to make sure we understand when Jesus is doing this, and as he identifies himself, not only as the son of David, the son of man, and the Lord of the Sabbath, depending on which story you want to listen to, he does identify himself as the one with kingly judgment, able to make rulings and so forth, and also as the sole arbiter, arbiter of the law. Jesus is making it really clear who he really is. And of course, the Pharisees are blind. You almost wish he could have healed them first, right? Help them to see who I really am. Jesus is choosing to value human need over compassion or over strict adherence to the law. He wants compassion over, over the letter of the law. He never says that the law is wrong. He never says the law is bad. He just says that the interpretation of it that keeps you from choosing compassion over the letter of the law is where you've gone wrong. And the Pharisees misunderstand Jesus' intentions and they understand it to be a destruction of the law, which, by the way, meant a destruction of who they were. I want to make sure we understand this. In part because, you guys, we sometimes become the Pharisees. So what do we learn from Jesus's, from the misunderstanding of Jesus' intention? I think one of the first things that we end up learning is that we have to place our own intentions with Jesus if we are going to align with God's heart. Amen. What was Jesus' intention? Jesus' intention was to honor the law completely, but to reinterpret it such so that compassion was totally okay, was totally fine, even if it was on oh, the Sabbath. I mean, you guys, the equivalent would be like one of you needs help today and the rest of us go, sorry, Sabbath. Sorry. The problem is, is that we look at the laws of God and, and sometimes we have added to them much like the Pharisees have. And then we begin to, to kind of say, okay, God's heart behind every law that God ever made was that we would be able to be proper, properly able to relate to one another and properly relate to him. Every law that God ever gave, that's what it was about. And what he's saying here is that if we begin to add to it, if we begin to, to go with the letter of the law, we become nothing better than accidental Pharisees. You see, sometimes one of our biggest challenges is that if something doesn't look right, something doesn't act right, something doesn't feel right, then we want it gone. Because you know what? It changes who we are as an identity if we allow the evil in. Do you want to know why the church is in such a bad place, at least in America? 
It's because we have so long been gatekeepers and not allowing people that don't look like us, don't act like us, don't think like us in, that we have been strict law-abiding citizens and we have lacked the compassion to let other people in. And by the way, if you didn't know that, it's why Jesus came. If we are known, if you're known by our love, why is it that when you go around talking about the church, what everybody wants to talk about is the rules? I have never ever been out in the community and have been talking to somebody who's kind of like, hey, you know, I'm not so sure about the church. Everybody loves each other there. Wouldn't that be a problem for us? People who go, wait, I don't know where I fit in, they would be like, well, you know what? I hear that over at the church, they love everybody. I'll go there. No. We're known by our rules. Well, if I join the church, am I going to have to stop doing this or that or the other thing? What would we tell them? The tension is real. I think even sometimes for us, it's uncomfortable to break a rule, even for all the right reasons. That if we were faced with following the letter of the law or showing compassion, that even for many of us, we would be like, oh, this is super uncomfortable. And that scares me. Because if you really want to know where my heart is, I'd rather do the right thing and take my chances with God. Where am I at? Identity is important, but not if the identity is a misunderstanding. It's important that we keep who we are. But I want you to think about this. Jesus came in order to redeem the law. To let us to, to, to begin to understand it that it is a guide, a very good guide, but that if we are so busy worrying about the very letter of the law that we have totally missed the point, that we will have totally missed the point. We had been warned when we were headed to Israel, Chris and I, that, that on the Sabbath day, be careful what elevator you jump into. Because there's such thing as a Sabbath elevator. And so you may have a 15, 20 story hotel room. It stops on every floor so that you don't have to push the button. For that would be work. What about compassion? Wouldn't that be what Jesus called us to be like? And by the way, we have just as ridiculous rules as a Sabbath elevator. I just want to let you know that. Are you open to what God wants to do to you in you today? How would you feel if you needed to pick grain on the Sabbath, so to speak? Would compassion guide you or the letter of the law? Second thing, and this one's a little harder. We learned that without alignment with Jesus and his intentions... We are actually against him. If you were with us over the summer, you know the story really good. Do you remember how Ahimelech's compassion turned out? Ahimelech helped David, right? And David's men, he, he gave them the consecrated bread. And ultimately, Doeg the Edomite was there. And he heard what was going on, and then he ultimately went to Saul and said, guess what was going on in the town of Nob? Saul ordered all of the priests to be killed, all of them. He, he instructed his soldiers in retaliation for what this compassionate act had done to kill all of God's priests. And the soldiers said, no, thank you. We can't lift our swords against God's chosen. 
Only Doeg the Edomite was willing to kill them all. And you got to stop and think about this because when, when, when Jesus brings this up, he wants you to be thinking of Doeg the Edomite. And what he's really doing is telling the Pharisees, in this case, Doeg is you. Doeg is you. Doeg went against God. He went against God's chosen priests. He went against what God's intentions would have been. So Jesus is really, he's really given it to the Pharisees, which is why you almost, like, they didn't even catch this, did they? And really begin to understand that God had something better in mind. Your intentions matter. Is compassion or the law more important to you? When it comes to Easter and and what's about to happen and what we're going to celebrate in just a couple of weeks, what is the, the key thing for you? Would it be compassion? Which if so, you need to be inviting as many people as you can into a fellowship with Jesus Christ. Now that's kind of a veiled, yeah. invite them to church. But I'm less concerned about you inviting them here. I'd be more concerned about you inviting them into your home. Getting to really know them. Getting to really pay attention, to show compassion. Do you realize that there are people all around us who are destined for hell if we don't do something? What is your intention? If you were to walk by somebody who you know, who you're an acquaintance with, who you'd even call a friend, and they don't know Jesus, would you say, hey, I uh, hope you have a great time in uh, hell? Hmm. If you have any compassion at all, you'd tell them about Jesus. You'd tell them about a God who loves them so much, he sent his son to die. He sent his son to die, but not until his son had gone through and challenged all of our expectations. Did you notice that? You have heard it said, an eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth, but I say... (laughs) question for us isn't compassion over law i really don't think that's really our our key question i think our key question is who do you intend to be at your very core who do you intend to be heavenly father I'll be honest with you in that sometimes I'm really a high valuer of rules. Suppose you created me that way, Lord. Maybe as a challenge that I would someday realize that it's not about the law, it's about what you have called us to do. And what you've called us to do is to, is to live and to be and to show others what it looks like to live with you. So Lord, help me to do my very best this Easter. Help me to seek out and, and to be sure that I have talked to all of those that I know and have made sure that they understand that I'm going to choose compassion over any rules. But the most important thing for me would be that I am aligned with Jesus' intentions and that I'm aligned with Jesus' heart and not against him. And my guess is that there's others in this congregation who are feeling the same way. I would even imagine that there are some listening to the sound of my voice who right now are, are, are kind of feeling that, that feeling that you get when you know that there's more you're supposed to do. Lord, for each one of us, we pray that you would fill that feeling up in us 
and point the way you want us to go. Lord, my intent this morning has not been to shame or to make anyone feel bad, but to encourage us that as we look forward to celebrating the most wonderful event that this world has ever and will ever see, the redemption of mankind, that we would be challenged and that we would want to do everything we can to be compassionate, to be loving, and to interpret all of the rules in a way that shows that we're aligned with Christ. We pray all of this in the most wonderful name we've ever heard. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for watching this message with me. If you want to see more, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the bell to be notified when we go live or post a new video. We'd also like to invite you to join us in person for a service. Visit us at desertgrace.org or give us a call at 928-305-1132. Thank you and have a great day.